On a cold gray morning in 1683, Molly Wash sat on a stool, tugging at the udder of a cow. She was a dairymaid, and it was her duty to get up every morning around five o'clock and go to that same shed and milk that same cow. The man who owned the cow owned the cottage where she lived, owned the manor house, and he owned all the land around. He was Lord. Molly kept on tugging. The milk squirted into the pail. And when the pail was full, it was her duty to take it up the hill to the manor house and hand it to the scullery maid, who handed it to the kitchen maid, who handed it to the cook. The jittery cow kept hooking his head. The week before, the cow had kicked over the pail of milk. The cook had warned Molly that she would be brought before the court if it ever happened again, if she ever stole the lordship's milk, because that was the law. Molly's shawl was thin, and her hands were very cold. But at last the pail was full to a frothy brim, and suddenly Molly sneezed. The cow jumped, the pail tipped over, and the milk seeped into the damp ground. Before the sun set that day, Molly stood before the court. The usual penalty for theft was death on the gallows, but no one who could read the Bible was executed for stealing. So the Bible was offered to her. That too was the law. Molly's voice rang out clear and true as she read from the Bible. Her life was spared, but the justice sentenced Molly to seven years of bondage to be served in a colony across the ocean. Having no family, Molly Walsh, age 17, said goodbye to her homeland of England and boarded a ship. After she landed in the New World, Molly worked for a planter on the eastern shore of Maryland. There, the cannons fired at daybreak, calling the servants to work. Molly tended to her master's tobacco crops, pressing the tiny brown seeds into the earth, picking the worms off the flowering stalks. Her calloused hands grew strong enough to control a team of oxen and to hold a plow steady. In her spare time, Molly sewed and she nursed the sick for more pay. And after working for that planter for seven years, Molly was free to go. As the law required, the farmer gave her an ox hitched to a cart, a plow, two hoes, a bag of tobacco seeds, clothing, and a gun. Acres and acres of fertile land stretched ahead of her. And just before sunset on that same day, Molly left the road and went four miles into the wilderness. Where? She staked her own claim. That a single woman should stake a claim of her own was simply unheard of. But Molly's new neighbor saw that the way she jutted out her chin. So they did help her build her one-room cabin. They helped her harvest and cure her first crop. They helped her cart the tobacco to the warehouse to sell. But Molly soon realized that the farm was too much for her to manage all by herself. One day, Molly read a posted announcement that a ship would be landing soon. Because she needed help working her land, she decided to watch the docking of this ship. It was a slave ship. She watched the men of Africa file by, one after another. She saw their misery their anger and shame on their faces as they were forced to mount that auction block. But then Molly noticed a tall, regal man who dared look into the eyes of every person. Molly bought him, and she vowed to treat him well, and she vowed that she would set him free as soon as her land was cleared. Molly talked to this man using her hands to tell him of her homeland, and her years as an indentured servant. He smiled at this strange-looking woman with eyes like grass and hair like straw and skin the color of the underside of a melon. <laughs> he told her his name, Banneke. Because he was not used to the climate in the American colonies, he was often sick with chills and fever. But still, Banneke would walk up and down the rows of tobacco, stopping to turn each leaf and reading it as if it was a printed page. He showed Molly how to dig ditches and guide streams of water down the furrows. 
And as the tobacco ripened in the fields, Molly and Vanicky grew to love each other. So she signed freedom papers, and a traveling minister performed their marriage rites. Molly had broken colonial law by marrying a black man, but her neighbors came to accept this marriage, and they all came to respect Vanicky. In times of drought, he shared his knowledge of irrigation and crop rotation. He learned this at an early age in his own native country. As the years had passed, Molly and Vanicky had four daughters. They had a large house and many outbuildings that overlooked their own 100 acres of land. But as a few more years passed, a great sadness had struck the family. Vanicky died, and Molly was all alone again. She drew her daughters closer to her, and she taught each one of her daughters how to work the land themselves. In time, Molly had a grandson, born of her eldest daughter, Mary. In her Bible, Molly wrote down her grandson's name, Benjamin Banneker. And you know Benjamin Banneker, don't you? <laughs> Oh, if you don't know Benjamin Banneker, you got to stay tuned to the end of this video. Benjamin Man Banneker, that little boy right there, he's somebody. Molly taught her young grandson how to read and to write. She told him about his grandfather, a prince who was the son of a king in Africa. And she told him about her days as a dairy maid across the ocean in England. For those of you that know, this is not a story of an English dairy maid named Molly Walsh. In fact, most of history has forgotten who Molly Walsh even was. It was her grandson, that little boy, that she taught how to read. That little boy Benjamin, he's the famous one. Benjamin Banneker was born in 1731, and he died in 1806. In colonial times, in the American colonies, he was a highly regarded scientist and a mathematician. He taught himself astronomy and surveying, and he was in fact appointed to the Federal Survey Commission that planned Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. did not exist before this man came along to develop it. The highest grade he completed in school was second grade. He was best known for calculating those little tables that showed the location of the sun and the moon and the stars. You know, those ways that colonial people measured time. So this really wasn't a story of Molly Walsh at all. This was the prequel to Benjamin Banneker. Now it's up to you to go and learn more about this man. A man who wrote Thomas Jefferson letters because they were friends. A man that George Washington regarded very highly. So yeah, you need to learn about this dude. There are a few quotes from this extraordinary scientist that stick with me, that teach us lessons that we still need to learn today. Here is my favorite quote from Benjamin Banneker. Are you ready? Read this one to yourself. 